The fact is that you actually have to include women and minority groups in the start of an initiative, not in, in the data itself or, you know, as an afterthought, but really bring those people at the table to help making decisions on what you are going to do, what type of algorithm you need. Your strategy must be designed by a diverse group of people. That's where you get the major results. Hi, this is Loris Marini, and you're listening to the Discovering Data podcast. We're here because we want to take responsibility for how data influences the world, and we want to enable individuals on our teams to achieve their highest potential. This show is for you if you want to understand the industry, find your tribe, and accelerate your growth. We bring you conversations with thought and practice leaders from all over the world, and create opportunities to connect and to learn as a community. Our new home is at discoveringdata.com, where you'll find a forum to connect with data leaders like you, episode transcripts, best quotes, and other material that can help you learn and apply your knowledge at work. If you have any feedback or ideas you'd like to share, please reach out to me directly on LinkedIn or Twitter. And now join me for this new episode. Let's stay curious and keep discovering data. A lot of what we do in data is to create new products, is find solutions to problems. And sometimes we need creative solutions and creativity stems from diversity. Every time we mix different skills together, we increase the chances of finding a new effective solution. What kills innovation is bias. So if we wanna build innovative solutions, we need to be aware of bias and correct for it. And I mean bias across different levels, from the actual data sets that we use to train models to the teams that set the strategy for the organization. And let's face it, as an industry, we could do a lot better to reduce bias across virtually every dimension, from age to gender, seniority, industry, and even domain within the data itself. If we don't fix this, we end up with wrong solutions that in the best case scenario affect our bottom lines and in the worst case scenario actually hurt people. And as data leaders, we're not immune to bias either. Without a safe space to connect, to debate and relearn, we can't grow and we can't have an impact on the world. So what can we do about this? What can we do about bias, diversity and inclusion? Today, I learned from Debbie Botha, Chief Partnership Officer at Women in AI, a non-profit do tank dedicated to representing minorities and inspiring women in particular to join the data conversation. Debbie is a thought leader in data strategy and subject matter expert in enterprise information architecture. Uh, she's worked for IBM for over seven years and helped countless organizations define and execute their data strategy. We talk about her career, the state of the industry, uh, imposter syndrome, the incredible value of mentorship, toxic environments and how to deal with them, the lack of standards in our own industry, and how women in AI helps women in particular to connect with their tribe, receiving help and inspiration across every phase of their career. And now let's get to it. Join me as I learn from Debbie Botha. So I'm pretty excited to introduce today the first of a series of uh, Discovering Data Leaders. The mission and vision of Discovering Data is about empowering data leaders, fixing the gaps that we see between business and technical. And so getting people slightly more interested, more curious, and hopefully use that momentum to solve problems more effectively. So not just build data products, but build things that solve real problems and impact uh, people in a positive way. It is about gaining range as opposed to getting specialized. There are many, many uh, schools that do one thing really well. There's a plethora of options for those that want to dive really deep into one aspect. But I found that it's a little bit harder to find things that broaden the, the horizon, you know, the spectrum of the different skills that you need. And so th that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to increase range. And so discovering data leaders is one of the ways we do that. The intention is to have brief conversations that don't focus on how to do stuff, but focus on the person behind the leader. 
can we have 50 minutes with them and imagine that we are tiny little flies that are invisible, probe into their lives, into their motivations and see what is data to them and what are the biggest problems they see. So it is a discovery uh, process like all others, except the subject is the person behind the leader. So the first one in the series is Women in AI. Women in AI is a non-for-profit organization and it's about women and minorities. It's about representing those that we hear less of. So the, the goal really is to inspire and influence data leaders and get more people to become a little bit more curious, find mentors, find their tribe and expand their understanding of what data is and how it impacts people's lives. So when uh, I landed on the Women in AI website for the first time. I realized I had a sense that we were really aligned. Then I met Debbie Botha, Chief Partnership Officer at Women in AI. That's when it clicked. I was like, we need to do something together here because our missions align so much and diversity speaks to my heart. And so here we are with Debbie Botha. Debbie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Laurie. I'm very happy to be here. Do you want to kick it off? Like, what? Um, how did you hear about discovering data in the first place? I've been very busy on LinkedIn as an observer, let's call it that, in 2021. I discovered your podcasts in the beginning of the year, and I kept on going back to your podcasts. I loved, you know, listening to, even if it's an hour, I was so willing to, to put aside an hour to listen to your podcast, because it's always interesting it's really getting the information from so far and so innovative the way that you describe things. I really enjoyed um, the human side of your podcasts and you really had very interesting people on your show. So I thought, you know, it, it would be brilliant for us to come together and bring that interesting conversations to the table with women in AI. Well, yeah, I don't know if you can see, but my heart is smiling at the moment. And the, the best thing that a, a podcast uh, host can uh, can hear, the best feedback is from someone that really enjoys the content because we it's uh, sometimes it feels yeah. like you put ideas out there in a vacuum. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. Really appreciate that uh, feedback. And, yeah, uh, and also uh, it, it is clear the amount of work that you put into the podcasts. I mean, the, the content is so dense and the ideas are so vast. It's really a pleasure to listen to it. I'm so glad that, that uh, you know, it's, it transpires you know, <laughs> through miles and miles <laughs> of physical distance. Um, <laughs> let's, um, um, let, me, let me deflate my ego a little bit now. And I, I, want, to, I want to talk about women in AI um, a bit more deeply, what what is the vision of Women in AI? What's the mission? What what are you guys trying to do? Yeah, so Women in AI, as you said, is a um, non-profit organization. With, um, we operate in about 140 countries. We have many, many volunteers working for us. Uh, there's ambassadors in the countries. I mean, the vo number of volunteers, I think, is about 180 by now. Um, with ambassadors in the countries, with their leadership teams, and then we have these chiefs <coughs> identified and appointed late last year to really help the organization scale in a more, much more mature way. Because we um, started in 2017 and we grew massively in a very short time. We now 10,000 members with a very engaging Slack channel, um, newsletters, you know, blogs, the web, and so on, and then 27,000 LinkedIn uh, followers. So we're scaling, wow. we're growing, and we want to scale in a much more mature way through partnerships. What we aim to do is to increase the numbers the presence and the eminence of women in AI from right. where they are educated in school right through to getting their first job, right through to helping them grow in their careers and pave the way for it, for these women. 
through various partnerships in academia, government, startups, and so on. So we launch these programs for innovation, for awards, education, talks. We love doing panels. And so that's in a nutshell what we do. So mentorship is, uh, in a way, a, a big chunk of, uh, of what you do. So it is, it's not just about diversity. It's also about mentoring those, uh, those people that are, in a way, left out from uh, the, the conversation. I see side effects um, of uh, limited sample size or skewed sample size in data science. I do have memories of um, uh, models that underperformed uh, because the data sets we put in were not representative of the uh, of the population of the real world, and this is a very known problem in data science. You, you know, a court of law using a software as an aid to decide whether to release someone or not. And a doctor in a, in, a, in a medical environment using computer vision and computer recognition to maybe detect early stages of a disease. Those applications are serious. You know, it's a matter of life and death um, or, you know, it's a matter of massively changing the quality of life of someone in the case of the court of law. And those are examples that require uh, the right ingredients as an imp at the input of the model. And the right ingredients means, obviously, the right data. How do you get the right data? It's a matter of <laughs> training people to recognize biases. Some people might say, well, what does gender have to do with diversity of a data set? One could spend, you know, 10 hours on this topic, but it's the topic of uh, meta metacognition, the topic of cognitive biases. We all see the world through the lens that we developed over the years as, as we grow up. And different people from different backgrounds, not just gender, um, see the world in a different way. And that lens um, creates a bias in our data sets. And so it's important to have diversity from just a purely algorithmic standpoint. But it's also important to have diversity because in the real world, we don't have clones of ourselves. We, we interact with so many different people. And so the more uh, we are exposed to different type of personalities and ways of thinking, the better equipped we are to actually solve problems in the real world. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> if I can go back to your point on bias in the data sets and why diversity and inclusion is so important, the... The fact is that you actually have to include women and minority groups in the, in the start of an initiative, not in, in the data itself or, you know, as an afterthought, but really around the table, bring those people at the table to help making decisions on what you are going to do, what type of algorithm you need. Um, you know, your strategy must be designed by a diverse group of people. That's where you, you'll um, get the, the major um, results. So um, in terms of uh, mentorship, um, you know, I, I remember most of the real pivots um, and bold moves in my career was based on my mentors and female mentors in particular. And I uh, remember the one, my favorite mentor in IBM, Mandy Chessel. She was a distinguished engineer and uh, she really took me under her wing and introduced me to a worldwide position, number one, which was absolutely brilliant. She introduced me to the IBM Academy of Technology, which was a huge privilege to be a member there, and also introduced me to um, the worldwide community of information architects, where I became a leader in the team of about 800 architects in IBM that really um, made me realize the importance and the benefits of a community. So 
that's that was that mentor that's a positive side but on the negative side um you know I, I have this desire to be loved by everybody and recognized for all the hard work that i do <laughs> i know it's silly <laughs> but um I, I, that's inherent in my personality and i have worked hard over the years to to not let it drive me but a couple of years ago i really found with a huge wake up call that there are women that does not love me that much and mm-hmm. they um yeah, particular women really I, i had to struggle to not feel bullied or offended or um you know put down in in some way so i think and she was a really a executive uh, that supposed to Ouch. take care of women and that it was when i got cancer basically last year where i where i th- thought what am i doing to myself here why am i allowing this to to get to me and because i re- i worked so hard i worked hard to please everybody and to get recognized but you know i did, i allowed this negativity to get to me and after the cancer i decided let's regroup recover become much more calm and just don't allow other negativity to get to you and rather learn from it and grow there's there's no such thing as a failure it's just get learning from it and, and growing absolutely uh, i think a lot of people in data and in entrepreneurship but in any field uh, need to hear a lot more what you just said because it's um, it's so true it's easy to spread yourself thin it's easy to get uh, stuck with the wrong metrics you know it's true in business but it's true yeah. in our careers as well you know and getting that positive feedback a recognition feeling that your people appreciate the work you do it's addictive it's a form of um, dopamine um, uh, cycle right the, the similar to sugar or other ad- addictive substances we want more and, right yeah and before the cancer i was always um, cognizant of what i say in public about vulnerabilities i wanted to look perfect sound perfect be perfect nothing is wrong with me or you know nothing really bad happened to me or everything is perfect but after the cancer that's one of the things that i shifted my mindset is it's okay to talk about the negatives and the positives because it also helps others grow i attended a, a, a conference late last year where the woman was talking about these alpha females or uh-huh. I can't remember what they called it, them but it was exactly this where and it was a whole hour of how to recover from experiences like that so it is a thing <laughs> women crashing and and yeah. uh, um, not uplifting other women <laughs> but i think the the positive to take out of here is i joined women in ai as their chief partnership officer late last year and the wisdom the compassion the absolute privilege to be part of that group of women was phenomenal i mean i i felt my i got my home i feel appreciated not that i crave it that much anymore but i mm. really felt that that group of excellent women that's really doing so well in their careers are there for me and for each other and for themselves you found your tribe i found my tribe <laughs> and i want to do that yeah, for yeah. other women yeah. also it's so powerful right like it's we especially the last couple of years we've all been forced to uh, isolate from one another but that really goes against the biology of our brain we're not 
we didn't evolve in isolation. We evolved because we were able to formalize, to, to create these partnerships with other people in what we used to call tribes. And so this word is kind of, it's an ancient word, but it's coming back more and more. We hear about communities online and in person and finding your tribe, but it is about, in the end, giving meaning and purpose to what we do and also share the pain. You know, there's a saying in Italian uh, that says something like a... a um, Mal comune mezzo gaudio, which basically translates literally to if you have a um, certain amount of uh, of weight and you share it with someone, it's half the weight. Even if the person is not physically helping you support the weight or move it around, just the presence of someone else can make the effort um, a lot easier. And so definitely, definitely um, it's, it's a huge point of it. Um, I wonder, like, you, 10 years at I, 9 years, 8 years at IBM, a lot of time, information architecture, how did you get into being an information architect? What was your entrance point to the world of data? Data. <laughs> <laughs> I love the data. Data. <laughs> and try um, to mix it up, you know, the I, audience is global, you know, so data, data, data. data. <laughs> data. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I actually started um, in, in the early 90s with uh, building one of the first data warehouses in South Africa at a short-term insurance company. And that's where I started working with the SaaS software. I was completely hooked. But that was where I saw that it you know you can't just go and throw a bunch of data sets into a pool and think you're going to get something meaningful out of it you really have to follow best practices or principles that that make sense and has been tried and tested when i started in the consulting world in 1998 that's when the the Kimball University books came out. And wow, man, yeah. those wow, books yeah. are brilliant. And I yeah. I started yeah. applying those techniques from 1998 up to now. I still refer to those books. You know, these concepts coming out like the data mesh now, talking mm -hmm. about domain-driven in, insights or domain-driven data products and things like that. These are things that has been written in those books in 1998. You know, distributed teams, all those things, it's, it's nothing new, it, but I really love the spin that uh, Jamak is putting on the data mesh because it's now not just the data warehouse, but the data lake and everything is a mess. Nobody is really mm -hmm. following the books or know about the books. But um, fortunately, there are those that has read the books and, and can come to the party to, to, to weigh in. <laughs> yeah, and reduce the noise because uh, it definitely yeah. feels, like, feels like a high noise environment from the perspective of the practitioner that doesn't have those 20 years of experience. Yeah. You jump around from one Actually medium article 30. to another one, and you're like, who is right here? <laughs> Can we establish a ground yeah. truth? <laughs> oh, you're talking about yeah. ground truth. You're the expert. You should know. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> cycle. Yeah, these, these, these old dogs, they, they call themselves old dogs, like um, bulls, Marshall. <laughs> Yeah, it's right, so yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> yeah, he, he actually wrote an article about the comparison about the conformed dimensions of the Kimball methodology, where he compared that to the data mesh. It was really funny. <laughs> I need to read that. I missed it. It, it was brilliant. It was so good. And then um, I think, yeah, Sh Sh Samir Sharma, he had a... Um, whole conversation with, with Bill and brilliant other people, Bruno from Google, John mm -hmm. Thompson, about the data mesh and about the Kimball conformed dimensions. <laughs> so, I need to watch that too. So, yeah. so you, you start essentially with a focus on building 
structures in the data, using databases to store and organize data sets. Is that, is that correct? That's how I started. I actually started with um, data mining type of programs development where we used SAS procedures to call data mining functions to predict fraud in, in the short-term insurance um, claims. So, and that was as early as 1995. And then, you know, I like to be quite broad in the things that I do. So I did data mining, I did data modeling, I did uh, data architecture, you know, designing the whole big picture, and then doing the data strategy, data and, and analytics and AI strategy. And I helped organizations um, what we call the chief data office now. There was always the mm. leadership teams that were formed in all the organizations. I helped them form those data teams. You're the embodiment of uh, someone that has range. Yeah, and, and when I mentor young people, they always, many of them want to go into business analysis or architecture, even though they have a solid programming education and background and I always tell them first spend a good number of years getting to to know as many let's say fields as possible even if it even the data space is so vast that you hmm. can be a data engineer you can be a data scientist you can be a analytics Translator. engineer or AI engineer so there's so many things that you can do with uh, the programming languages and stay technical for as long as possible while growing your architecture and your business analysis and, and those type of skills and your project management skills. Do that, but stay technical. And that will give you this ability to stitch everything together when you mm -hmm. do the more architectural and management type of roles. There you go. Um, what concerns you about data today? What is the number one thing that we're not doing right and we should as, a, as fast as possible? If you look at the, the landscape of data, let, even data architecture, data tooling in all the various fields, we're all over the show. <laughs> there's too many architectures, there's too many um, tooling, the, and there's open source, and there's just too much. And I think a lot of the newcomers, that's why they come up with these new ideas that's ages old. It's because it's just all over the show. There's no common language in our field. There's lots of different opinions that's a lot of times overlapping and conflicting even. <laughs> but um, I think we should we should get to a common common architecture, if you will, and common tooling. Yeah, yeah, in a way the, the a global thing, taxonomy exercise. Yeah. <laughs> The other thing, a simple example is the data mesh versus the mm -hmm. data fabric. There's a huge difference, but some people still say it's the same thing. Even the data fabric from its original meaning up to now, it mm -hmm. also changed over time because of vendors' perception and they wanted to infuse their technology discussion into it but another thing that that I'm wondering about that I see happening is the the whole thing of self-sovereign identity and privacy issues that we that we have and you know the regulation and everything that's going around that yes. if you ask yes. any generation Z which is born uh, 1997 and before. 
whether they mind if Siri listens to every single word they say in <laughs> order to come up with a very personalized location-based offer. I have not come across one Generation Z that minds that. They love it, right? So they say, they even come up with examples of how they were telling their friends that they feel like takeaways and all of a sudden there's a very personalized That's offer on their mobile phone about yeah. a takeaway place very close by. They don't mind. So that's the, that's our future generation that actually wants no privacy in exchange for extreme personalization and we you know we all dogs have to consider that and maybe you know <laughs> get a common ground <laughs> there's always obviously the the, and the money laundering, the fraud, the you know serious things that can happen if we don't take t- uh, privacy seriously. But we need to consider this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about the problem of um, the shortage of talent. How many students graduate and they just clearly not ready for the industry they don't know what to expect they've been trained to work with very clean data that's been already uh, prepped for them and they can't wait to do the cool stuff you know where we quote unquote cool stuff we mean the latest uh, reinforcement learning um, algorithms the latest image recognition software Uh, we both know that a lot, the, the largest majority of organizations don't need that really they would already be so much better off if someone was was to walk in and standardize business terms with a business glossary and define what people mean with names like customers or products or order that's not to say that all of that stuff is useless it's just uh, that i see a lot of focus on that and not enough on the management of data as an asset what do we do with all this these kids well how do we how do we bring them up to speed yeah i think what we need to do is is to really get into those schools and universities and uh, teach them data literacy data fluency i think that's just the the foundation is not ai the foundation is data literacy and then when you mature, you get into data f- fluency. Um, and data literacy, when you teach that, you, you can cover a broad spectrum of fields at a fundamental level. Basically, you need to do that with the schools, the universities, first-time jobbers, even executives. Yeah. <laughs> I think oh, yeah. that's where the common language yeah. will come in. And then have more accessible education and more short courses rather than these long university degrees i don't say that yeah. it's wrong it isn't it's yeah what, what what's wrong is the expectation that at the end of the course you're relevant yeah because the the field within those five years moves moves so quickly so i also think the uh, apprenticeship idea is brilliant mm. where you where you actually start working, get thrown in the deep end and get yeah. courses as you, as you progress. Learn and apply, learn and apply, learn and apply. I think that's something that we'll see much more of in the, in the future. Mm, very interesting. An idea for a business, for sure. Um, yeah. wh- wow. Debbie, what, what's Trailblazers? Yeah, Trailblazers is the new partnership type that I identified for women in AI. And that is for women that are really already very visible and eminent in their careers, visible mm-hmm. in their organizations. They, they have um, proven themselves to be great mentors and uh, inspiration to other women. I want to recognize them and have them as 
a partner of women in AI. Man, I love my so, job. Um, <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Your job. <laughs> Yeah, so this is, you know, I I got the name Trailblazers from two women that um, wrote an article for World Economic Forum. I think Bina Amanath, if I say it correctly, and Kay Firth Butterfield. They are already prominent, prominent women in AI. Bina is the is the head of the AI Institute, I think, of Deloitte. And Kay Firth wow. is, is leading, I think, AI in the World Economic Forum. So they are true trailblazers <laughs> wow. with lots yeah. and lots of followers on social media. They said there's basically five ways to inc increase the women working in AI. The one was they said we have to support the STEM education, they said we have to showcase female AI trailblazers. They said mentor women for leadership roles and create equal opportunities for them. And then we, that we have to reward people in the same way, financially and otherwise. So that's where I got the name from. And I really want to honor these women well if discovering data can help at least with one of those five the showcasing bit um then uh that would be a, a fantastic 2022 i think to contribute to that idea so. of um getting people to see hey there's a there's a there is so much you can achieve you know look at these people look what they've done and uh, you can do the same you know it's not a matter of uh, iq anymore it's a matter of how you structure your learning how you seek different point of views because we learn when we when we're forced to face the reality that our way is not the only way and sometimes there is a better way <laughs> it might burn a little uh, especially for those that come from an academic heavy background he is one you know when you the, the the system teaches you to pass an exam right so there's there's a lot of focus on getting it right and what's the mark you got you know is it a 30 out of 30 is it a 20 you know it's so it's so pointless to measure that because that's not the outcome is just a number and a number is a huge compression of information there's so much that goes into passing an exam absorbing knowledge navigating a career uh, getting promoted, becoming more useful for the organization, changing career. And uh, there's there are no books for that. You know, there's people that know and maybe have direct real life experience doing it. And it, man, if only I could access, you know, but back when I was, when I decided that I wanted to become a data scientist and lead a team, I would, it would have been immensely useful to have someone say, hey, check this out, you know, what do you think? Am I on the right track here? <laughs> or am I completely yeah. missing the mark? Um, yeah, so if we can create that space, uh, imagine how many people can accelerate that progression, you know, because we, sometimes you just get stuck. We don't know who to ask. And yeah, it's just a pity. No, definitely. Two last questions I wanted to ask you, Debbie. Um, what would you like to see more of in the data community and what would you like to see less of? I think more of is, is this common language that, that I spoke about. Uh, I think that will really help. Another example that I can give of that is um, we started with these concepts of DevOps. And then we said, mm -hmm. okay, then there's data ops, which makes sense. And then there's ML ops, which still makes sense. But now there's AI ops. And guess what? AI ops does not mean the same thing as the other three. It is AI for ops. Mm. So it, it, okay. it should be called ops AI, not AI ops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they got the order wrong. <laughs> so it's making operations easier by harnessing algorithms. And yeah, it goes into the infrastructure and the operations, you know, and right. puts AI on top of it to improve the infrastructure. 
so make things faster, more efficient, and sort of optimize the system. So it's a it's an optimization problem. Yeah, exactly. It is called AI ops. Therefore, it should mean the ops side of AI, ops for AI. But it means mm-hmm. the other way around. So there's maybe an idea that I'm throwing out there because I I did think about something similar in the past, but I did not follow up because I felt a bit of imposter syndrome, and that stopped me from actually. <laughs> yeah. um, getting getting <laughs> getting on LinkedIn or like hey who wants to contribute but it was this idea I think I think the idea initially came from the master data marathon 2 with Scott Taylor um, I attended the conference I loved it and we people were struggling to tell stories of how bad data uh, impacted real businesses and, and people and so I thought, why don't we create a master data story uh, table? <laughs> we yeah. contribute to the stories as much as we can share. Obviously, there are, you know, it gets tricky, it might get political, so we kind of have to be careful. But if we do it right, instead of having one person n- crack the problem of data meaning, you know, unifying, creating a vocabulary for all these terms and what they mean, we could have the community contribute to that and have a system of triaging and merging these things. I mean, I'm still, still in the back of my mind. Maybe we should execute it. What do you think? I think so. I, I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that made me come up also with this frustration is when I joined IBM and there was this concept of a data reservoir but the rest of the world was talking about a data lake but the data reservoir meant something different from a data lake Mm. but the the vast majority of people inside and outside IBM had completely different understandings and interpretations of these two things so yeah no definitely please <laughs> let's do we should this start it. yeah it's going to be really tricky at, at first imagine how many debates on linkedin and twitter threads that people say you know what are you talking about loris what are you talking about debbie but yeah it's fun right like i don't care i'm okay with being you know with looking ridiculously stupid it's perfectly fine you know as long as we uh, as long as we reach <laughs> a state that is slightly less confusing <laughs> than than it is exactly. today then i've done and, my and job you mentioned the imposter syndrome i think a lot of us a lot of us, much, much more than one would think, uh, it, suffer from that, definitely. Because if we didn't, then we would have all shouted out, but hang on, I thought this is what it means. Now you come with this idea, oh, you must know better than me. Yeah. Yeah. And also uh, yeah. you asked, what would I like to see less of? And Mm. that comes back to this thing of newcomers or youngsters coming up with all these new concepts that's ages old. I would suggest that they first at least Google if their concept Mm. isn't isn't there before they go mainstream and viral with new concepts that the old dogs will tell you they've gone through it, there's books written about it. I'm going to say one good thing about science and uh, and um, research education. There's so many good things and bad things about academia. We all know, you know, those that have tried both worlds know what I'm talking about. But there's one thing that I really like is the um, mindset of putting things in, in context. When you start a new research, when you exper- a new experiment, the very first thing you do before you even start buying the equipment is do a whole lot of literature research, see what people have done. And soon you realize you start from here, you know, you're thinking that your idea is the smartest, the newest, the most amazing. Then you start Googling and after two weeks, that's the trough of disillusionment when you realize that actually, (laughs) you know, the entire world has been doing experiments on that exact same thing. You thought it was a niche and a brilliant idea, but it isn't. And so now you have to find a new spin or a new angle, but that's part of the process. And it looks like in data, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. We just want to say, hey, this is new, shiny, look at me, look at me. (laughs) <laughs> exactly and and um you will have that something special that you will be able to add to the existing 
understand. For sure, exactly. You don't have to go home. Absolutely agree. <laughs> exactly. You don't have to throw it away. Just add your your sweet spot to it. Yeah, but don't scrap the history and the context, please. Because then, when I, it's especially you know, when you read the paper, you're like, "What did these guys do?" Oh, okay. Oh, wow, that's a brilliant idea. And then the first page I want to read is give me an overview of what ev everything that's been done in that field to date and how does that yeah. thing that you're trying to do compare with the macrocosm of ideas that people already tried is it entirely new is it slightly new but it doesn't have to be new to be interesting <laughs> right it could be a spin on something that already exists ah uh, anyways uh Debbie I feel like uh, I, I took way too much of your time and um I want to perhaps before we leave I wanted to uh ask you what's the best place to follow you what is the best place to follow women in AI and uh yeah any anything any last thing you would like to share before before we move to a cup of tea me I'm on LinkedIn Debbie Bueta straightforward you can email me at debbie at womeninai.co. Women in AI's website is womeninai.co. And Women in AI is also on LinkedIn. Very active. And I would like to, you know, just request the listeners to go and look at the website. Ladies can register as members. There's a place to request for partnerships. Um, we have mm -hmm. commercial partnerships and non-commercial partnerships for communities and media and so on. So please have a look. We'll, we'll gladly collaborate with you. Fantastic. Yes. Call to action time. Absolutely. Do that. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to uh, the list of Discovering Data, that's also a good time to do that. We'll probably be cross-referencing uh, each other through the show notes sometimes it's at the bottom sometimes it's on the left sometimes you have to click but you know where your show notes are click on that you'll find uh, a link to discovering data and a link to women in ai and uh, I'll, uh, I'll definitely include debbie uh, debbie's linkedin profile url there as well so we can keep the conversation going debbie thank you so much for being with me and uh, enjoy the the rest of your day thank you thank you so much it was such a pleasure Thank you for staying with me until the end of this episode. I hope this means you found the content useful and relevant. There is a lot happening right now over at Discovering Data. We're working on a new series of live events, more amazing guests, and we're starting to plant the seeds for a future conference. If you want to stay in the known, you have options. Hop on discoveringdata.com and subscribe to our list or share your knowledge and make new friends by joining our circle. And that's all I've got for now. A big ciao from Sydney, Australia, and I'll see you in the next episode of Discovering Data.